Elijah was born in Manchester, England in um, 1853, um, in the middle of this mar marvelous Victorian period. And uh, the Victorian period I consider to be very much on a parallel with the period that we're going through, especially uh, 1990 to 2000. I think there are a tremendous number of parallels, particularly when you think about computers and how things have changed, how our life has changed in the past 20 years. The Victorian era was very much like that. And in the Victorian era, in fact, um, Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species, the Scarlet Letter was written and published. It, this, by the way, I'm sorry, this was 1853, the year that Elijah was born, in Manchester, England. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne completed the Scarlet Letter. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, the first anesthesia operation was done at Mass General Hospital. Uh, steam locomotives were flying up the east coast of um, the, the United States seaboard. There was a steam-powered um, uh, ship going down the Mississippi River. Uh, gas lights were the illumination of choice everywhere. That's what it was, just like we have electric. You know, it's that, that was the kind, of, and everybody was thought that was just great. Um, the first pencil and eraser was, uh, was developed in 1853. The Crimean War was started that year. Um, Franklin Pierce was president of the United States. Queen Victoria reigned over the United Kingdom. And as I said, Elijah Thompson was born. And he was the second of what would be 10 or 11 children. There seems to be some difference about whether there were 10 or 11. And uh, his mother's name was Mary Ann, his father was Daniel. And um, as a second child, he took his place in the family, and his mother obviously just continued to have children. And when he was about five years old, there was a depression in Europe. His father was a mechanic, and he had a good job in Manchester. You may know, some of you, that Manchester is a manufacturing city. And, uh, but he lost his job, and so they decided to come to the United States to, uh, to, to find work for him and, and to rear, rear their family. And of course, it was a tremendous move for the family. Well, they came by transatlantic um, uh, ship, of course, and they arrived in New York, and they uh, did not stay in New York. They went right to Philadelphia because, and this is very interesting, Philadelphia was the center of manufacturing at that time. There was a lot going on. Um, there were over 6,000 manufacturing establishments in Philadelphia and uh, with a population of over 500,000 people, which was a lot. So his father found work in a factory, and um, Elihu started school in a public school, and they lived in an industrial area. Now, I've done a ton of reading for this because I'm grateful to Mary because it really forced me to, to do research. And I don't want to put you to sleep, so I'm going to watch you very carefully. <laughs> um, Elihu, as a youngster, would wander around the neighborhood. He had a lot to look at. There were factories all over the place. And if you can imagine the stimulation that was for a young boy, you know, he'd open up a door and look in there and there'd be pulleys and belts and all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and so it stimulated his imagination. And he was a very good student. When he was 11 years old, uh, he'd gone through grammar school. He took uh, an exam at Central High School, which he aced. Now, Central High School was a school for um, boys who, who didn't have a great deal of money, but had a, uh, a lot of scientific or uh, who, were, who were smart. Sort of like the Bronx High School of Science or Latin School in Boston. Well, he aced this test. But they told him that he was too young to go. He had to uh, be 13. So they said, you take two years off. And he was kind of skinny. Not yet. And, and he, um, he was a little on the sickly side, so uh, he, uh, he had two years not to go to school, but just to kind of wander around the neighborhood. Well, he did a lot during those two years. Um, there was one periodical called the Imperial Journal of Art, Science, Mechanics, and Engineering that his father used to get 
on a regular basis from, from England. And in that magazine were tons of articles about uh, very famous scientists, people who had Kelvin and Faraday, people who were already working on wonderful experiments. <clears throat> so he read these. He also told his mother he wanted to learn about photography. <clears throat> Excuse me. So she got him a book called The Magician's Own Book. And he said, and he, and this is in retrospect, as he wrote his memoir. He said, I don't want a book about magic. And she said, look through it. You may find it interesting. Well, it had tons of experiments in it, chemistry experiments, uh, uh, physics experiments. And he went nuts. He ground lenses. He learned, he made, he took, and this is in a lot of books, and it's in a book I put over here. He made a, took a wine bottle, and he created a hole in the bottom of the wine bottle, put a lever through it, and a piece of silk. So he had a handle. And he was able to create static electricity by turning the handle of the, uh, the lever. And I mean, he was maybe 12 or 13 years old. So obviously, this was a very exceptional uh, person from the get-go. Um, Bernard Carlson, who wrote his PhD thesis about um, uh, Thompson, said that he, in his formative years, because Thompson did all of this stuff with his hands, he created craft knowledge, the ability to create models out of wood that were extremely important, and they did prove to be very important in later years when he started inventing. So he went to the uh, Central High School. He finished. Uh, he graduated. There were 180 students who matriculated at Central High School. There were 18 who graduated, and he was four out of 18. So he was an extraordinary young person. One of the students that uh, uh, he took classes from was a man by the name of um, Houston, Edward Houston. And uh, they admired each other greatly. Um, and Houston became a great figure in his life. They were very important to each other, actually. Um, well, Elihu got a job um, at a place, uh, in, at, a, at a foundry. He worked there for about six months, and he hated it really hated it. Um, he was looking around. Well, in the meantime, one of the teachers at Central High School um, got ill, and they needed a replacement. So they called on Elihu, and he became an adjunct professor at Central High School after having just graduated, and he loved it. And he earned a title which he kept and, and loved the rest of his life, and that was the professor. Everybody called him the professor. <coughs> well, so he's teaching at Central High School, and I think he was making 500, and, yeah, I know he was making $575 a year. And um, he was working with Edwin Houston on the side, and they were creating things, they were making things. And Houston knew the ropes. He was the, he could take the experiment that um, Thompson would put together, and he would write it up. So, Finally, um, Elihu developed a, uh, his first invention was a tie that would tie um, the, the horseless or the carriage to, a, to tracks. And they, they submitted that invention to the patent office, and that was his first, um, that was his first uh, invention. Houston wrote it up. Houston got the credit. Very interesting. Houston um, felt that he was the mentor, so he, and Elihu, was kind of like the, the, the student, didn't get any credit. And it was an interesting relationship because it continued like this for a long, long time. Uh, well, anyway, finally, uh, Thompson became, uh, was elected to be head of the, this, by the way, is the chemistry department, the chemistry department. He was made head of the chemistry department one summer. Uh, in 1878, he took a grand tour of Europe. Uh, imagine, here is a young man from a very modest home. His father was working in Cuba uh, on, on machinery to, uh, for sugar refining. Um, his father had got hit on the head trying to save a, a young boy who ran into the equipment. His father couldn't work. The family was relatively poor. But Elihu knew he was going to take a grand tour of Europe. And he went to Europe for nine weeks, spent most of his time in France. Um, 
Uh, by the way, he had joined the Franklin Institute, uh, the American Philosophical Society, so he was already beginning to mix with people who were doing original research and who were teaching in Philadelphia, and he had a sense of who he was. He was about 25 at this time. Went to Europe, and when he was in Europe, he saw electric lights on the Rue de Opera, right, you know, where the Opera House is. There were a couple of electric lights set up there, and he was fascinated. And he thought, this is what's going to be the future. Electric lighting is going to be the future, and I want to be a part of that. So when he came back, he told Houston, he said, let's work together and form a business. And they did. It was called um, the Thompson Houston um, Company. And uh, they were working on arc lighting. And their first uh, business assignment was from a, two uh, people, Thomas uh, McCollin and uh, George Garrett. And they said, we want you to design a, um, an incandescent lighting system for for us. This is going to be for a bakery. And you know, at a bakery, they work all night long, they have no lights, and um, they need illumination. So this was going to be a great investment of their time. And uh, Thompson did it. He invented this system. He did it by working in this bakery night after night after night, all during the summer and the fall. He was also teaching. So he was in 100 degrees all night, and he was teaching during the day at the Central High School. He was not a lazy man, full of ambition, full of ambition. Well, he, uh, they, the bakery uh, didn't buy the system. I, um, another company did. They bought it for about $2,500. And at that time, that was not a bad, you know, that was not a bad investment. What happened? Um, the Philadelphia market for inventions wasn't that great. And um, Philadelphia was a wonderful uh, place to learn where there were organizations like the Institute and so forth. But in the meantime, a man by the name, oh, you know what, Mary, if you want to you show that, because I'm sure. thinking this is about. OK. Yeah. I'm just going to keep for a few minutes. OK. okay. All right. Then we put them on. We have a few pictures that we like. Um, I'd say he was in his middle twenties then. I have no idea the circumstances under which it was taken, but um, anyway, I'd say he was middle twenties. So he he was he was then approached by a man by the name of Frederick Churchill. Frederick Churchill came from New Britain, Connecticut, and this may be coming closer to what some of you know about Thompson. Um, Mr. Churchill was a lawyer who had a, a great deal of interest in inventions, and he heard about Elihu. And Churchill said, "We got a group of people together." We want to start a company, and we'd like you to come up to New Britain and be the inventor for this company. Now, again, um, we're talking maybe 1875, uh, 1876. This was a fabulous time. I mean, think of Google and what's going on in you know on the in California and on 128 today. How exciting that is! Well, this was a very parallel time. There was a great deal of excitement. People were getting rich. They were um, getting involved in all kinds of invention. Electricity was being seen as a, a possible commodity for the future. And um, the American Electric Company wanted um, Thompson to come up there and work for them. So. He had to think about it because he was leaving his family behind, he was leaving his, his job at Central High School, and he loved to teach. He was, by that time, as I said, a full-time professor in the, in the chemistry department. And uh, all of the uh, occasions when he would go to the Franklin Institute and give papers, but he decided that he would go because it was a wonderful opportunity. So he went, he was uh, 27 years old, 
and um, he left Philadelphia and he went to New Britain. And he took with him a, a person whose name comes up later in history by the name of Edwin Wilbur Rice. Um, Rice had an opportunity when he graduated from Central High School. He was about seven years younger than uh, Thompson. He had an opportunity to go to Yale, but he also thought he was very smart. He said, Thompson is going to Britain. He's a very smart man. I'm going to go with him. So he didn't go to Yale. He went with Thompson to Britain. And uh, they went to work together at the American Electric Company. Um, well, let me just say this. Around this time, uh, just to give you an overview of what was going on, um, the population in the United States was growing. In 1870, the U.S. population was 40 million. 1900, it had grown to 76 million. In 1870, 10% of the population lived in the cities. Uh, by 1900, 20% of the population lived in the cities. So there was a big labor pool. There was a lot of natural resource being shifted by train from one place to another. And there was a great deal of opportunity for young men like Thompson. Thompson went to American Electric and he worked there for a few years. Uh, he invented uh, quite a bit, uh, but he found at that time that American Electric was not investing any of their money in marketing, and they weren't investing their money in inventions, and that's what he was doing. They weren't putting money where he needed to have it. Um, he didn't have the equipment he wanted, and uh, he was getting restless. And what happened, it was a real tragedy. Uh, Mr. Churchill, who was the, the uh, original founder of the company, uh, ran into a financial problem. He owed his stockholders money. He was spending money on his own uh, inventions, and he killed himself. He blew his brains out. So the company, everything stopped for a while, and they hired another manager. Now, the new manager who they hired was actually very good. He saw to it that they installed a, an electrical system um, in Kansas. Now, I neglected to mention to you, one of the things that Thompson was working on was a central power station. All of the electrical setups that had been made up till that time had been, it's, it's hard to believe, but there was a light, there was a little dynamo. There was a light, there was a little dynamo. So for every light, they had a piece of equipment that would power that light. It was very clumsy, and um, obviously you could, how many lights could you have under those circumstances? But Elihu, at this point, had invented a dynamo that could power up to 75 lights. So his thought was, if we can do that, let's do a central power station, like we have today. We'll create all the power, we'll funnel it from the central station to all of the branches, to all of the people who are buying power from us. Um, so the American Electric Company did, in fact, sell a uh, system in California, or in Kansas. In the meantime, in California, there was a, another company called the Brush Company. They were big uh, competitors of American Electric. Brush was also working on alternating current, as was Edison. So there are now three companies have emerged as leaders in the electrical industry. Well, life can be very serendipitous. And what had happened was that um, uh, American Electric set up a little a test station on Tremont Street in Boston. And who should be walking through Tremont Street in Boston but some gentlemen from Lynn. One of them was Silas Barton, he owned a stationary business. Charles Prevere, who owned a tanning factory. And um, I'm sure these names are familiar to you. Um, and Charles Coffin, also a businessman. These were men with money. They were looking for something to invest in. They go to Tremont Street, they see the setup, and there's a little metal plate on the setup that says American Electric Company. So they went to New Britain, Connecticut, and they said, we'd like to meet Elijah Thompson. And they said, 
you've got a great system here and we're very interested in you. We'd like to work with you. Uh, we're, we're very interested in electricity. We think it's the, it's the invention of the future. And, uh, and uh, Thompson felt the same way. So Thompson got into a, a battle with the stockholders of, of American Electric because they hadn't lived up to their contract with him. So he withdrew from his contract, he moved to Lynn, he became um, a principal, and they changed the name of the business to Houston uh, Thompson, or Thompson Houston. <laughs> and uh, they went to work, uh, they, only Thompson, because I should mention this to you, uh, Houston never left Philadelphia. And all of the things that uh, Thompson patented, all of the work that he did, his name was always on the patent, not just Thompson's. And that actually is true today, where I believe there's a, a house in Thompson company in France. But he, um, Houston would write up, do the writing, but it was Thompson who, made the, who did the inventing, who made the models, who understood all the, uh, the intricacies of the machinery. So, um, from 1883 to 1892, the uh, Houston Thompson Company in Lynn grew like a powerhouse. Coffin was the CEO. He was a brilliant CEO. He had a great deal of faith in Thompson, and he said, whatever you need, you can have. Um, they bought out uh, Edison, eventually. They bought out the brush company. Uh, Westinghouse was another figure um, because Coffin's brilliance and uh, Edison's genius were a fantastic combination. And Edwin Rice, the, who was heading the factories, um, and uh, it was just incredible. The number of employees um, grew from 45 to 3,500. Annual profits increased from 93,000 to one and a half million. I mean, we're talking 1890. So, uh, I mean, that's pretty incredible. Um, and Bernie Carlson, the PhD author and the writer of several books, says the best years of Thompson's inventing life were from. Uh, my grandson, my daughter. I'm very proud to have them. So. From 1880 to 1885, Thompson was averaging about uh, 21 patent applications a year extraordinary for one human being. Um, while he was in New Britain, Thompson met uh, the Peck family. Uh, one of their sons actually worked for him, and uh, he fell in love with Mary Louise Peck, who uh, he was courting at the time. And uh, he continued uh, his association with uh, the, uh, the Thompson Houston Company. Um, by 1891, Thompson Houston had established 666 electric stations, Westinghouse at 323, and Edison 202. And Edison, who was a brilliant man, but not a particularly good businessman, uh, and he had backing, he had the backing of Wall Street behind him. Um, but he finally agreed, as I said before, to merge the company. So it became um, the General Electric Lighting Company. Um, and in 1884, uh, Thompson and Mary Louise were married, and they moved to Lynn. Um, we're, our, our interest gets very hot at this, this time because sh shortly thereafter, they started thinking about building a home. And uh, they hired an architect. They built a home. Uh, they were decided to build this home in Swanscott. Now, as many of you know, 
the, uh, the land uh, around the mall is part of the uh, Swampscott Land Trust, and Frederick Law Olmsted subdivided that land, and uh, Thompson bought one of the most beautiful parcels of land that was uh, available at that time. And in fact, uh, my favorite time of year, and I'm sure those of you who go to the mining community for the 4th of July fireworks, it is so, I think, I know that we have the most beautiful um, town center of any town in the whole country. Because how many towns do you have an opportunity to stand on this beautiful green and look out to the Atlantic Ocean, and behind you is this magnificent mansion it's extraordinary. Uh, well, Thompson decided to build a home there. And he said, you, he designed the home, but he said that he would, he would create all of the internal um, embellishments. And when you go to the house and you look at the carvings on the mantle and um, the pillars and all of the beautiful um, embellishments that are there, these were things that Thompson had created himself. Uh, and asked the architect <coughs> or the, uh, the builder to put in. So not only was he an inventor of electricity um, and all kinds of mechanical artifacts, but he was also um, an architect and, and uh, understood what a beautiful home could look like. He built in that complex a, um, an, a passageway that went from the main house to the carriage house. And we have pictures here that show you that beautiful passageway. Um, and that was so that he could walk from the house in this covered structure into his carriage house to work on uh, his experiments. And I did um, want to read this to you. His son, Rose, um talks about the carriage house, which we were fortunate enough to see on Friday, the carriage house um, we're hoping that, if I say it out loud, it will happen. We're hoping um, that the carriage house will become a, uh, at least the top floor of the carriage house will become a museum because we have so many wonderful artifacts to put into this place. His son Roland said, you might have thought you were entering a first class workshop. Shelves, boxes, pegs and hooks were everywhere, hung with tools, <clears throat> wire, metal strips and springs. On the right, a bench, the full length of the room. To the left, a large machine lathe. Further on, a planer, and still further, a small machine lathe and a bench with a complete outfit for soldering and brazing. On the left, a cabinet with machine tools, jigs, dies, and a special bench with a watchmaker's lathe. In the electrical laboratory, there were wires, switches, meters, a photographer's darkroom, cabinets containing x-ray tubes, Geissler tubes, and a motor-driven vacuum punch um, pump. Also available were a battery of storage cells, cabinets full of prisms, lenses, telescopes, and microscope parts, plus shelves full of chemical of every description. Um, this is where he spent a tremendous amount of his time. And as his son said, no one dared to cross in from the bridge, from the house to the secondary building without getting permission. And uh, we will have we have a connector now between the two, um, and an elevator, so that you don't have to climb the stairs. We just wait till you see. <clears throat> so, at 19 in the year 1919. Uh, Thompson was being feted everywhere. He traveled the world. Um, he he received he was receiving medals. As his second wife said, she felt she had to carry a basket to collect all the medals that he was given over his uh, the latter part of his life. Um, his wife passed away. Mary Louise passed away. And in 1922, about five years later, when he was almost 70, he remarried. And um, as he said, he got himself engaged. That's how he put it in his memoir. And his second wife was said to be a very social, outgoing woman. She encouraged him in his older age to get out. They went, they took several trips to Europe. They met the king and queen of uh, England. And uh, they went to the West Indies. They went, he went everywhere. 
And so you have to imagine that the house in Swampscott was the center of the greatest social life in this town. I mean, people, Calvin, and well, Calvin may have passed by now, but uh, Steinmetz, who was one a great uh, uh, chemist who worked for the company, he was there all the time. I mean, people of great stature from MIT and Harvard were coming and going there to visit with him and to socialize with him in that beautiful dining room that uh, we have restored, that the town is restoring. Um, <clears throat> he built a telescope. He made the entire telescope himself, the tubes, the lenses, um, and he had a, uh, a planetarium built on the front lawn of his house, and you, you'll see pictures of it here. Uh, and he would go there, and he said that his mother was his inspiration. His mother encouraged him to study the stars and um, astronomy, and he loved it. Um, he was given the Chevalier of Legion of Honor from Paris, the Edison Medal, the Calvin Medal in 1924, the Franklin Medal in 1924, the Faraday Medal in 1927, the Grashoff Medal in 1935, and he created over 700 patents. Now, I said in the newspaper, um, Mr. Derringer called, and he said, tell me some things about uh, Mr. Thompson that I can put in the paper. And I thought to myself, being the mother of a newspaper writer, I know that it's important to give people something really smashing. So I said, well, he did believe in life on Mars. And he said, really? Well, I didn't think he would make it a headline. But uh, <laughs> I don't want Thompson to seem like, you know, a kook. He wasn't. In fact, what happened was he used his uh, telescope, and he was able to identify what he believed was vegetation on Mars. And he felt that the canals that people saw were actually um, areas that very small animals were traversing from at different seasons to go from one part of Mars, one part of the, uh, the um, planet to the other. And he did believe that there was life on Mars. Um, he studied x-ray technology um, after Wrench in, in, in invented it. And uh, it was a huge hit. And people were x-raying their heads and their hands and their bodies. They thought it was fabulous. What they didn't understand was that they were harming themselves. But again, he was such a renaissance man, he decided that he would uh, experiment. So he used two fingers of his hand, probably his left hand, exposed them to x-rays over a period of a year. And he would go to a conference, <clears throat> and he would hold up his hand, and he would say, look, you see, I have lesions on my hand. I have, ex you know, I've, I've uh, exposed my hand to x-rays. X-rays are dangerous, and they need to be respected, and you need to be careful with the way you use them. So, and in fact, um, we were looking at a newspaper clipping the other day about electricity. I, I was blown away by this. He, um, a man was bitten, a mailman, who uh, was it? A policeman. <coughs> policeman was bitten. I just want to tell you something later. We have lots of things over here yeah. that have to do with Thompson, but while she tells the story, here's the picture of the, the patrolman in Lynn who was bitten by a dog and they thought it might have had rabies. So you can tell the that. He's, he, um, he was very sick, <coughs> and Thompson said, let's give him some electricity. <laughs> so they gave him a charge of, I think, 500 amps of electricity. Well, the man was, they shocked him, and the man, you know, the man eventually died. He didn't die from the electricity, however. And when you think about it, that electricity is being used today uh, for shock therapy for people, and it's a hugely important tool in treating people who have, who have a depression. And the fellow became afraid, I believe. He received the first few volts, and then he just dropped the handles and left. And yeah. then he died because he had indeed did have rabies. But if he had stayed, maybe it had more yeah. of the voltage. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very interesting that 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 Thompson even thought of this. Um, well, uh, Thompson uh, passed away in, um, oh, let's see, 1937, and um, 
he, uh, he was accorded a great deal of honor by uh, his peers. And um, the town, uh, the, the, his wife lived in the house for another three years. And uh, at that time, in 1940, she went to the town and she said, we are willing to sell this house to the town uh, if you're interested. Well, one thing about Swampscott, God loves Swampscott. We don't do anything without, you know, a study and a lot of argument and discussion. But we went to town meeting, and they appointed a committee to to uh, study the committee to to study the uh, issue. And the the committee was appointed, and they uh, decided at the end of three years to uh, make it a town hall to purchase the town hall, and it was purchased for. $30,000. The house was assessed uh, a few years before that for almost $100,000 as, as early at, at that time as it was. It was a lot. And uh, so the house was purchased by the town, and by 1947, it had been altered sufficiently to make it suitable for a town hall. Fortunately for, for all of us who really care, because I know that if you're here, you care. Uh, William Neal and Associates were the architects who did the transition. And they were very, very careful to preserve most of the towns, the character of the house. Um, some of it, for example, there, there, were, there was a row of bay windows. When you walked up, there were three steps, which had to be removed a couple of years ago because those three steps made it not handicapped accessible. But the, the steps were left there by Neal. They kept the carriage house, but they did remove the connector between the main house and the carriage house. Um, most of the uh, furniture, um, the furnishings of the carvings on the mantles and everything was left as it was. And, and that's how it was adopted for use as a town hall. Um, well, we have the plans for the emerging, the new town hall, which will, we think, be done by March. And we've brought them here so that you can look at them here and you can talk about them. And I just want to finish up by saying a couple of things. Um, Sylvia, would you like me to show the slides and then maybe have you finish up? Okay, that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, slides sure. of the uh, interior of the house when Thompson lived there. Um, Doc, could you take that last light off for me, please, um, and show it? And you'll see some of the things that Sylvia was talking about. This, um, I believe he had an interest in electric cars. We don't know if this is one or not, but this is right at the part of the, uh, the monument where we have the, uh, the flowers uh, spelling the word swan spot. And you can see Thompson's uh, observatory over there on the left that's on the lawn of the town hall. And an interesting thing, we looked at this picture up very, very carefully. And uh, in those days, they, the women kept put netting. They actually, even the men, I believe, over their hats had netting because they were afraid of the fumes from the cars and the dust from the streets and the mud that was being picked up. So this person in the back seat, you can see this uh, hat type thing that really comes right over the uh, face. So that was something to see. And that's, uh, again, uh, we. That was uh, the monument to the World War I men who were killed. And that street layup, as you can see, is certainly no longer there. And a little bit more clearly, you can see the observatory in the front lawn of, um, of Elijah's house. And this is an aerial view in 1930. Uh, and you can see the town hall on the left, or the house, I should say. It was a town hall then. On the right, you can see the Chicks Estate. Uh, that's where Linscott Park is now. Hadley School is there in 1930. Uh, and you might recognize some of the other buildings. Notice that the actual monument area has the one monument in front, but then the rest of it is just uh, greenery, it's just plain green. And this is, uh, this is what Sylvia was talking about, too. This is the observatory in the front lawn of his home. This was, uh, Louis tells us, this was a Christmas card. This was the Thompson's Christmas card from the year. It's a beauty. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, what Sylvia was mentioning. 
uh, the connector between the house and his laboratory. Underneath is where the carriages would go through. You see that the middle arch is larger than the others. Probably automobiles later, but earlier, uh, probably carriages. And then up above is the walkway that he would take. And they said in the middle of the night, he would leave the house and walk across and over to his uh, laboratory. Uh, so, so now we have a connector there now, uh, but, uh, so, but not, not one that looks like that. <laughs> Now, I love this picture. This is looking uh, from the front door. Uh, if you've been to a town hall, you'll recognize it right away, the stairs going up. The main thing that's different is the, same, the uh, picture where the bow windows at the end, they're gone because that's a door, actually, that goes now outside. Um, uh, the fireplace to the right, the little chair that's there, uh, the little seating area on the right. And the, table, and the table on the left, the uh, Swansea Historical Commission saved that table, and we'll have that in our museum someday. But we have that table, that exact table. I like the picture so much. It's really <laughs> cool. But this is a little bit back, a little bit further. But and here it is again. Now it's like into the selectman's office, which would be that room on the left. Look at the wonderful Oriental vibes. Uh, so Victorian, the uh, oriental screen right in front of the stairway, uh, beautiful paintings with uh, lovely frames, just beautiful. This is the dining room and this is where the town clerk's office, clerk collector office is. Um, we were noticing yesterday when we took the tour inside that when you went to pay your taxes, there's a, um, a counter, and then there's all this grill work, and you just kind of slide a little envelope through the grill work, and you never really get to see the magnificent woodwork that's in that room. Maybe when this is uh, restored and it's back to being town hall, they'll have it uh, in a way that you can actually appreciate the woodwork a little bit more because it was, wasn't it yesterday, we could actually see the room and it was just magnificent. But behind the gold of the uh, dome, the light, you'll see these uh, almost like banister uh, railings. And that's how, that, that you, you can still see those in the town clerk's office. This is the same <coughs> room, a different, uh, this is years later, so it has a, a different lamp, a Tiffany lamp, I might add. And uh, this is again the town clerk's office. Just a different view of it. Okay. Uh, same thing, there's a little breakfast nook at the end. It's where they have their breakfast. So um, that's still the same office that we know of as the town of our office. This is the music room, which was, uh, Louis, am I right, next to the selectman's office? Yes. Right. Right. So. He was quite interested in music, right, Sylvia? Oh, and yeah. Pipe organs, he invented a pipe organ. Mm -hmm. and, and and he, he installed the pipe organ in, in, the, in the house. He built it himself. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. And what happened to that? Do you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Somebody said there were some parts of it were remaining. Console is on the second floor of those stairs. Um, this picture was not in good condition uh, when I took the slide, but uh, this is Selectman's office. What's this, Louis? Selectman's room. This too? Yeah, yeah. Oh. from the music room, looking out towards the, the main hall. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah. So the, so when, if you were to go to a Selectman's meeting, Underneath that painting is where the chairs would come out, the benches. Correct. You'll be sitting at the selectman's table. Here it is again. Beautiful woodwork. Right now, or not now, but before the restoration, there was a big wooden carving of this town seal, right, with that painting. Now, 
Now here is uh, what the building looked like when the town took it over. They bought it in 43, I guess, but didn't move in as a town hall until 47. But uh, there's a screen porch to the left that is no longer. And then that stone balustrade in the front is no longer. But other than that, it's very the, much the The cucumber on the barn is missing, or the stable is missing. Oh, that's right. Look at that cooler um, on top of the... Uh, Carriage um, house. Yeah. Oh. Oh, and then uh, we've taken pictures of uh, the construction work that's been going on, so I'll show you that now. Great pictures. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> just on a lovely fall day, early, late summer day, I should say. This is when everybody moved out. And the work began. So what I like about this picture is that uh, it's the first time in a long, long time that you could see from uh, Elmwood Road to Borough Street. You can see right between the two buildings. That uh, hasn't been that way for many years. And this is looking from the library lawn on Borough Street at the back of the building. Still, there's a nice division between the two buildings. This is the elevator shaft you see. Yeah. <clears throat> I love the carriage house. What a beautiful building. Where the post office is, and they had a goldfish pond 
Um, and nobody ever chased them away. Remember, this was a place where they had servants, cooks, cleaning people. I mean, you know, it was very special, but they never chased them away. And Sheila talked about how she would go to the, one of the side entrances and the cook would always bring out a platter of cookies. So they were very nice to the children in the community as well. Um, and I, I've thought a lot about Thompson. I know when I go through the house, I can feel his presence very strongly. I, um, I just feel he was a, a very extraordinary person. Um, they talk, he's, to, he's uh, referred to as being quiet and devoted and self-effacing. Um, but I think he was probably not willing to suffer fools. He was very bright. He had honorary degrees from many, many universities. He, uh, you may or may not know, donated the land for the library to the town for a dollar. Um, so he, he was a, a very complex and uh, wonderful, I think, a wonderful human being. And I just wanted to close with this. Wilbur Rice, who, like Thompson, became a very wealthy man. He was from a fairly uh, humble circumstance in Philadelphia. He's the one who accompanied Thompson to New Britain and then came to Lynn. Um, when um, Thompson's 80th birthday was held, people came from everywhere to, uh, to attend. Uh, I don't know where it was. I like to think maybe it was in the New Ocean House. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it sounds really wonderful if it was. And Thompson got up and he spoke, and I just want to read you a few of his words. Um, Thompson was probably about 74 at the time. He said, he has been my professor ever since I met him way back in the year 1876 in Central High School. It was a case of love at first sight, and what a discovery. What a mine of knowledge, ready to be explored, as willing to give as I was to receive its richness. There was no question that I asked to which I failed to obtain a satisfactory reply expressed in language that I could understand. The reasons which he gave for the seasonal changes and the color of a rabbit, for the imitation by certain flies of the honeybee or of the stinging wasp, wasp, for the mimicry of leaves and sticks by butterflies and beetles, appealed to me as much more plausible than the orthodox doctrine that all these things were created for man's enjoyment or for his discipline. So that was a life of Hodgson for us. Uh, where was he buried? He's a great question. He's buried in Pine Grove Cemetery in Lynn. Oh. Yes, and um, there's great. Um, there's there are a number of uh, great uh, um, Google sites. If you Google uh, him, there's one that's got about 11 pages with some excellent pictures, by the way, and it shows his headstone. It's in Pine Grove. Yes. Uh, you mentioned his um, the uh, uh, the house there where he kept all his tools and everything. Mm -hmm. Any idea what might have happened to all those things when he passed away? Yeah, um, ninety nine percent of it was brought over to the main <coughs> building of the General Electric up on the second floor, which was where his office is, and he also had a um, laboratory there. From there, uh, around about 30 years ago, they were all moved up to um, Schenectady, New York, and have been cataloged and supposedly stored. Maybe we can get them back. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. the observatory is in Pennsylvania, but um, there's a life-size marble bust that I've kind of hinted around to Schenectady that would look great in the lobby, but, but I haven't got an answer yet, so. But that's where they all went. Synaptity was where Edison's laboratory was, and they took that laboratory over when they when they became when the three companies uh, joined together. So Schenectady became the the place where they did all the research, and they wanted him to go to Schenectady, but he wouldn't go. He'd go up there maybe once a month by train, um, and then he stopped going. Uh, he said he didn't want to. He was much happier during his research uh, here. But we, about 10 years ago, we had a group of um, people from GE, including Bernie Carlson, who came here and we had an event at the town hall. Um, 
And what we should do is try to assemble some of those, uh, see if we can call on some of those people uh, again and see if we can't retrieve some of those things for our museum. Brad Gerhard Moon is still alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but his wife um, is very generous and she might be able to help us. Yeah, sure. yeah. Do we still have that Tiffany lamp? Yeah. The one that you showed the picture, I'm sure that's gone. Mm -hmm. well, his, I mean, his wife actually um, <coughs> took a lot of the furnishings and things with her before she sold the house to the town. So really, there weren't too many furnishings. Was it the second wife, Clarissa? Yes, Clarissa Hovey. Yeah, she. She was. Um, she worked at a. Um, she was a clerk in a, in a bank. I should make. I'm not exactly sure, but um, had a very uh, four-week courtship, and then they got married. <laughs> One of his sons died, and um, so we had three sons and a, a few grandchildren. And um, and George. Thompson passed away about a year ago. He was acting in town. Very, yeah, he was a selectman. I met him several times, actually, and I'm really sorry that I didn't um, talk to him about you know, preserving some of the stuff. Right. Did you have a question? Anyone else? So, obviously, one of the sons are named in town, named after. Are there any other of his descendants in town? One son was Malcolm. Um, George told me a story once that the the dentist is on the corner of Humphrey and Burrow. I don't know the dentist's name. That White House. That one of the sons lived there, and his child, or Thompson's grandchild, would take took piano lessons in the main house. And one day Thompson was home while the piano lessons were taking place. And the story goes that after the lesson, the little, one of the maids took the little boy by the hand and was walking him across the lawn. And behind him were three, um, the gardener, a butler, and someone else carrying the piano. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia, so, so much. That was so